So now I'll begin with lesson 15, our final lesson. Uh, evaluating project design and earning your online institute badge. So the topics uh, in this session are uh, evaluating project design and for that I'm going to show you the PBLL design rubric. Uh, and then the remaining topics are all about the badge and getting your deliverables to us for the institute and applying for the intensive summer institute. So for the first part, let's focus in on evaluating project design. I'd like to remind you to uh, help you remember when John Larmer talked to us in lesson one, he talked about essential project design elements and to a lesser extent, he talked about project-based teaching practices. By now, these elements of uh, sustained inquiry, authenticity, student voice and choice, et cetera, are pretty familiar to us. But uh, plainly, these would form our point of departure when we want to look at a project plan and see whether it conforms to gold standard project-based learning. So we would want to answer these questions. Does the project focus on key knowledge, understanding, and success skills. And success skills is another word for what we sometimes call 21st century skills of collaborating, critical thinking, and so forth. Does the project start with a challenging problem or question? And more than one part of that is important. When we say challenging, we mean that it is a question on a deeper level a question that you can't get the answer for, to by searching in Google. Does the project engage students in sustained inquiry? So are students digging deeper? Does the project show authenticity? And remember, there are several kinds of authenticity. There's the authenticity of the project product with regard to professional standards and practices in the world. There's the authenticity of the language and materials that you use? Are they made by native speakers for native speakers? And then there's personal authenticity uh, that the project is in harmony with the student's desire to, to transform the world, make a difference. Does the project encourage student voice and choice? Is there room for the students to have input into the project? And I'd like to remind you of two projects that I mentioned earlier. Uh, in which the original plan was to create a monolingual project product, but because of student input, the, the project product ended up being in two languages so that access to the product would be enhanced. Does the project incorporate reflection? Uh, because I think it was John Dewey who said, we don't learn by studying, we learn by reflecting, something like that. Does the project include critique and revision? Because only through an iterative process of drafting and improving can we achieve the high quality that is a hallmark of project-based learning. And does the project result in a public product? And it's not simply a public product. It's a public product that has an impact and is transformative in the world. So that's the gold standard for project-based learning and that would form uh, our point of departure in developing criteria to look at a project plan. Now, the Buck Institute for Education, where John Larmer is the head of publications, does have some ready-made rubrics that offer a generic assessment of a project plan. So here we see a project design rubric, and this is without reference to what field of study the project involves and it centers around key knowledge, understanding, and success skills, the challenging problem or question, and sustained inquiry. Actually, uh, the rubric is bigger than this. I don't have the whole thing here. Uh, so this rubric is useful. However, it's not specific to our field of inquiry, which is language. We're trying to go from PBL to PBLL. And in the interest of doing that, uh, we have a rubric of our own for project-based language learning. And the questions that we are answering, in addition to the questions I just addressed are, 
does the project foster language proficiency development in the three communicative modes? Does the project address the development of pragmatic competence in the domains of language, interactivity, and behavior? Does the project effectively scaffold language development, collaborative processes, and product creation? Does the project provide for regular and useful assessment of meaningful student learning outcomes? And does the project allow your learners to use technology to engage in critical inquiry and problem solving? So with these questions in mind, we've developed a PBLL design rubric. Now this rubric is a work in progress. As we move forward to this year's Summer Institute, we probably will make some modifications to this rubric. Uh, so it represents a sort of generic rubric for the assessment of project-based language learning project design, and it does not include additional worthwhile aspects such as interculturality, that is the student's development of the ability to occupy a place in between two cultures to, and to look at their own culture through the lens of another culture. It does not address career connections, which can be a very useful framework for designing a project. It does not address project management. It does not address political skills, which could be useful in uh, a project that uh, attempts to uh, affect some political outcome. And, you know, there are many other kinds of things that a project could address, and you would need to make a rubric to assess the design of the project uh, for those things specifically. Let's jump in and look uh, at a few details about this rubric for project design. The first category that I mentioned was language proficiency development. And here on this page, we see at the bottom the three uh, uh, domains of communication, interpretive, interpersonal, and presentational. And uh, the project plan criterion is that communicative language functions are addressed across all three modes of communication. And uh, we have descriptors for the project design from emerging to exemplary. An exemplary project would explicitly identify and develop communicative language functions across all three communicative modes in ways that engage learners in meaningful personal expression and active negotiation of meaning. As far as pragmatic competence goes, as Marta just mentioned, we can assess students' language with respect to pragmatic competence their interactivity or management of communication, for example, turn taking, whether they overlap with the other person's speech and so forth. And we can assess behavior uh, in terms of embodiment, body language, gesture, gaze, distance, and so forth. Uh, and so uh, a product, a pro sorry, a project plan as part of its overall inquiry uh, should provide for learner attention to language accuracy, language appropriateness, embodiment in communication, as well as pragmatically appropriate content and conduct of communication. And an exemplary product, a plan, would, would uh, do those things. Uh, okay, next uh, category is, does the project design provide adequate scaffolding? Adequate instructions, modeling, and help for the student to achieve whatever task is set before them. And a properly designed project would use a wide variety of different types of scaffolding strategies that would be strategically embedded throughout the project to progressively support language development, cultural learning, comprehension of disciplinary content, collaborative processes, technology use, and product creation. That's a tall order. All right, I'm talking about assessment of the, uh, in the project plan. So uh, a well-designed project should chart learning outcomes, content, and refer to the world readiness standards for learning languages that are es established by the American Council on the Teaching of Foreign Languages. Should include formative assessment, 
and uh, use rubrics. Um, so this is a very complex part of the project design. An exemplary project would explicitly address language, disciplinary content, and culture in meaningful, measurable ways well aligned with learning outcomes and standards, and would provide for regular formative feedback from learners, peers, instructors, and community. These things would be strategically embedded in the project plan, in the workflow to improve work in progress and the final product. Notice that a well-designed project should not include assessment only from the teacher. The students should be involved in self-assessment and in peer assessment. Also, the criteria for assessment should be co-constructed with the learners and an even number of performance descriptors concretely identify what learners must do to elevate their work to the next level. Now, the reason why an even number of performance descriptors, such as we see here, one, two, three, four, is that in assessment, it's a great temptation to assess everything in the middle, not too, not too great, not too bad. And so we often find ourselves regressing to the middle rating. If you have an even number of descriptors, then it's not possible to fall into the middle. All right. Um, finally, the final category is technology and success skills. So basically, uh, this is investigating effective use of technology. In an exemplary project, learners would effectively select and employ a diverse array of technological tools in safe, legal, and ethical ways in order to generate and exchange information, create well-designed, innovative products, or provide useful services for communities of target language speakers. I'd like to emphasize here that even though we're teaching language, PBL means that we are never going to be able to isolate the things that we are teaching from uh, overall success skills. So using technology, for example, in ethical ways means that we are imparting the 21st century skill of uh, observing copyright law, for example, uh, as part, as an integral part of our teaching of the students. Okay, um, you'll have a chance to look at uh, those documents yourself. Uh, so I'm not going to spend too much more time on that. Let's move on to earning your badge, uh, qualifying for your badge, and so forth. All right, so number one question is, why earn a badge? Earning a badge will strengthen your project planning skills. Uh, by doing all the tasks that we ask you to do in this institute, you will move closer to being able to produce a comprehensive project plan that would score high on our rubric, which would in turn help bring you closer to gold standard project-based learning. And also it will help you participate in a shared knowledge base with other PBLL practitioners. I think it's really important that we observe the standards and practices that have been established by the Buck Institute for Education, uh, even if we want to critique them. Because often nowadays when we go to conferences and we see presentations that say project-based learning, what we find is that they are missing uh, often more than a few of the essential features that uh, make PBL worthwhile. Completing the badge would set you on the road toward project implementation, and last but not least, qualify you to apply to attend this summer's NFLRC Institute on Pragmatics in PBLL. So some more details on that. Qualifying for your badge, it's important to observe these deadlines. It doesn't matter whether you're listening to me live now or you're uh, listening to this recorded footage after a delay, the deadline will be the same. If you are planning to apply for this summer's Intensive Summer Institute, you need to complete all the online institute requirements, deliverables, and so forth by March 31st. If you're not planning to apply for the Intensive Summer Institute, 
but you still want to receive a badge, then your deadline would be July 31st, 2018. If you forget those dates, you can find them in the modules uh, under that first button there, important dates. All right, so what do you need to do to qualify for your badge? This is a very shortened version of the elements in the badge criteria. You complete the online modules. You complete and submit these deliverables, three project ideas, which we saw in module one, three initial product squares that we saw in module two, three revised product squares that we saw in module three, scaffolding for one authentic text, which we heard about last week from Cherise in module four, and upcoming, at, uh, when this module is posted, you will be asked to deliver a reflection on your experience developing your product squares and a rubric for assessment. The other criterion is that you need to participate in the get involved discussions in the modules. So these are the things that we will be looking at when we uh, decide whether or not to award badges. If you forget these badge criteria, they are available in the module at the second button there. So these deliverables that were the smaller bullets, if you uh, maybe can't keep them all in your head, you can, you can find these uh, in the apply sections of lessons three, six, nine, 12, and 15. Those are the final lessons in each of the five modules. In those apply sections, you'll find specific instructions on how to submit those deliverables for that module. As you're doing this, you need to prepare your work first on your own and then use the linked JotForm surveys to submit that work that you've done. If you forget what uh, how to uh, submit deliverables, what the deliverables are, then you can follow this link. Uh, as soon as today's lessons are published, there will be naturally a deliverables page in lesson 15 for you to look at. All right, so in order to get your badge, you need to complete those things that I've just described but then you also need to tell us, hey, I've completed my work. Please examine it and uh, decide whether I deserve a badge or not. So in order to do that, the most important step to activate that process is to complete your institute evaluation. So when you've finished all those qualifying tasks that I described for the badge and you've submitted all your deliverables, then complete the institute evaluation form. And when you complete the institute evaluation form, you'll be directed to complete the digital badge request form. You can't get that digital badge request form unless you do the institute evaluation. So what you're doing when you complete the digital badge request form is, uh, first of all, it's a different form from the institute evaluation. The reason is that we want our institute evaluations to come in anonymously. We don't want to know who is filling in which form. But for the digital badge request form, of course, it's important who you are so that we can send the badge to the right person. So once you've submitted that digital badge request form, we need a little time to look at all the materials and you will be badged if you have met the criteria. Then we will send you an email with the badge to the address that you used for registration. If you don't know where the institute evaluation form is, I'll tell you now, it's the fourth button uh, in the modules. So uh, when you're all done, you've done all your deliverables, you've participated in the discussions and so forth, that's when you'll fill out your institute evaluation, not before. Okay, um, once again, if uh, you want to apply for the Summer Institute, doesn't matter whether you're listening to me live or later recorded, the deadline for
for completing all your work and completing the institute evaluation form badge request form is March 31st and if you forget you can always look at the important dates document there now once you've gotten your badge then you can apply to participate in the project-based language learning intensive summer institute and this year's theme of course is pragmatics in project-based language learning this is a residential summer institute so you would come to Honolulu uh, it's one week long Wednesday Thursday Friday and Monday Tuesday Wednesday so there's a weekend in between uh, and the co-leaders will be Marta gonzalez Choret, who you just heard from, and Cherise Montgomery, who you heard from last week, supported by the staff here at the National Foreign Language Resource Center. Uh, the link to view the detail page is here in this uh, uh, set of slides that I'll be sharing with you as usual in Lesson 15. So you can read more about the Institute there. Admission for the Summer Institute is competitive, uh, and we are able to offer stipend support to 10 participants out of around 20 that we will be accepting. Uh, so uh, that's a competitive process. We will look at the applications and determine uh, 10 meritorious applications uh, for which we will provide partial funding for travel. Uh, aside from that, the cost of the Summer Institute is minimal. Uh, it's $125 to help us defray costs. Uh, other than that, there's no charge. All right, um, so that brings me to the end of my presentation. I will now uh, entertain questions if there are any.